We are going to start now because it's nine o'clock. Starting time. Can you hear me? Sam? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of the CC 2021, which is about computer science and computer engineering. My name is Wilfrido Gomez, and I'm going to be the chair of this session. Today, we have six papers focused on machine learning techniques and applications. And the rules for the presentation are 15 minutes uh, of exposition plus five minutes for questions. And we recommend to turn on your camera at the time of your exposure. Questions for the audience will be at the end of the presentation. You can raise your hand in Teams to give permission to turn on your microphone and ask your question. Also, you can use the chat to write your question to the author. Our first uh, paper is uh, entitled Multimodal Deep Learning via Late Fusion for Non-Destructive Papaya Fruit Maturity Classification uh, by the authors Sinmaji Garilios Manligues and John Xiang. So uh, you can start, please, uh, Sinmaji. Please allow me to share my presentation. So, buenos dias, Mexico. Good evening, Philippines. I am Shinmei Garilis Manliguez, a PhD student of the National Sun Yat-sen University in Taiwan. And together with me in this paper is my advisor, Professor Jan Wai Chiang. So I will be presenting this morning my title, my paper entitled Multimodal Deep Learning via Late, Late Fusion for non-destructive papaya fruit maturity classification. This will be the outline of my presentation. I will be discussing briefly the introduction and objectives of this study, the methodology, results in discussion, and conclusion. So for the introduction, the image classification is a task that assigns a particular label on a single image or a group of pixels or vectors in an image according to a rule or an observed characteristics. It is a major challenging task in computer vision because it is a basis of a series of more complex operations for applications. Deep learning has the capability of independently gathering abstract representations of an input data through processing layers of neural networks, and it has been successful in unimodal or single modality implementation. Modality is an independently is independently classifying a single channel of sensory input or output. And traditionally, applications of image classification use single modality. However, using multimodality data sets for classification tasks is increasingly getting high interest in research. So, for instance, in this illustration, we can integrate RGB images with an infrared image and its depth map in order for us to produce a more sensitive analysis and precise results. In agriculture, classification task has long been a major operation, especially in fruit maturity classification and fruit breeding. Image classification brings automation in pre-harvest and post-harvest operations. And most research studies explore multimodality with agricultural data obtained using imaging technologies like RGB images and NIR data. And this leans towards non-destructive alternatives in doing operations by using imaging technologies. 
Fruits are considered as high or rich source of antioxidant, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and fiber, and it is crucial to human health. Papaya is a major tropical fruit. Globally, it is highly nutritious. It has pharmacological properties, excellent flavor, and has a growing commercial value. In fact, there is about 13.58 million tons of papaya production globally in 2018, in which about 60% of it, it comes from Asia, and the rest are from other regions. The trop tropical fruit industry is also, has also contributed the biggest source of income in the Philippines and Taiwan. And most research studies also include fr fruit cultivation, production, pre-harvest management, post-harvest handling, and fruit trading. Also, post-harvest regulatory measures and quality standards on fresh produce imposed by both exporting and importing countries help reduce the risk of associated of chemical safety and health to consumers. And so fruit trading is an um, utmost importance in the export industry. Fruit maturity evaluates the physiological development of a fruit when it ripens or continues to ripen even after harvesting. And it includes the changes in color, size, texture, flavor, and nutrient content. Perishability and susceptibility to adverse handling and the storage conditions are also dependent on harvest maturity. And these are, uh, this is a critical factor to preserve post-harvest life and reduce waste and increase fruit quality. Multimodal deep learning in fruit maturity estimation is an agricultural application that benefits from the potentials of multimodal deep learning. And with this, we can use different modalities such as hyperspectral signatures, RGB images, among others, for us to obtain and estimate uh, uh, the classification or the maturity or uh, the grade of the fruit or agricultural produce. And these are the summary of the different grading characteristics that can be assessed using the visible and hyperspectral imaging. The main objective of this study is to propose a multimodal deep learning model via late fusion approach for high performance papaya fruit maturity estimation using hyperspectral and visible light imaging technologies. And these are the key contributions. In addition to the main objective, we also develop deep convolutional neural networks uh, that are explored as base learners and multi class logi logistic regression as meta learner of the multimodal late fused networks. Benchmarking of performance of the proposed approach and existing works in agriculture in terms of F1 score, top to error rate, and computational time are also uh, made. For the methodology, deep learning in uh, multimodality, deep convolutional neural network automatically typically extracts domain-specific features from the input samples, regardless of the pre-processing operations. And the multimodal learning strategies can be employed in two ways. So these are feature concatenation and ensemble method or late fusion. This also implies that learning the multimodal relationships can happen from low to high levels of abstraction in the deep uh, CNN. For feature concatenation, it carries out early fusion in the input data from multiple modalities and uh, to achieve a single vector output. And for the late fusion, it trains and learns the features for each individual modality first before integrating the result to yield the final class estimation. And in this paper, we will implement the late fusion approach. This is based on the recent studies in agriculture or the, the, the reason for this is uh, the implementation in the deep fruit, which is about early fusion and uh, late fusion approach, has produced uh, a, a significant output or performance in detecting fruits in the plantation. And they used faster RCNN, near infrared image and RGB images. Also, our former work, our previous work, which in, implements MDR multimodal CNNs for feature concatenation of hyperspectral images and RGB images to estimate fruit ripeness, which also produced a competitive results uh, using VGG16, AlexNet, and VGG19. 
So uh, for the experimental design, we will be using the data set used from our uh, previous study. And you can see in the chart and in this table, the different, uh, the distribution of the images. And we will be using the RGB images and the hyperspectral data patches for us to maximize the data, uh, the data set. So the total will be 4,608 hyperspectral and 4,608 RGB images. This is the sample maturity uh, stages of the papaya fruit that is uh, compliant with the Philippine National Standard. And these are the setup that were uh, done in our previous uh, uh, work. So the hyperspectral imaging uh, setup, which used a, a VNIR, hyperspectral imaging system with 150 bands in between 470 nanometer to 900 nanometer wavelength. And the Canon EOS 100D with a digit 5 image processor for the RGB images. This is now the proposed uh, framework which is the multimodal deep learning via late fusion or multi deep lab. So in this framework, we can see that the inputs, the RGB images are, are composed of three channels and the hyperspectral data cubes are composed of 150 bands, which will undergo data pre-processing and will be the input to the, their respective deep learning models, which are the base learners of our uh, MDL or multi deep lab. So the base learners will learn the features of the input and produce their preliminary result, which will be the input to our meta learner. The meta learner is the level one model, which again, again learns the pattern observed from the base learners and uh, to increase generalization and reduce errors. So the, B, the meta learner will now produce the final prediction, which are the uh, different fruit maturity or the predicted fruit maturity. These are the base learners used in this study, AlexNet, which consists of eight layers, which is faster to train and ideal for real world applications and thus is selected in this uh, study. It also implements rectified linear unit for nonlinearity, max pooling and dropouts to uh, avoid overfitting. VGG-16 and VGG-19 are also implemented as these are robust models and state-of-the-art methods in large-scale image recognition tasks. And they also implement very small 3x3 three three convolution filters that enables it to deepen its layers. And with increased depth, there will be more representations and more improved network accuracy. This is the example um, framework of the AlexNet uh, implemented in a previous study and in this study also. This is the, the framework of the multi -mo, uh, multinomial logistic regression, which is the meta learner of our uh, framework. So the X sub R are the predictions that were, uh, that were produced by our uh, level zero learners or our base learners, as well as the X sub H for the hyperspectral, X sub R is for the RGB uh, images. And this will be, uh, this will be, Input entered into the meta learner, which will learn these features and the patterns to produce our output. The it, uh, MLR also implements the softmax um, activation function. For the computing environment, this is the training and the testing environment used, and the performance evaluation. For the results in discussion, these are the observed. Uh, uh, these are the observations from our. RGB images, and we can see the, the ripening through this uh, yellow stripe of the papaya. And these are also the observations from our spectral uh, data. So we can see here the distinct, the distinct feature from about 600 nanometer to 700 nanometer uh, wavelength, which can be identified with our neural networks. And we also implemented parameter setting experiment for us to improve the model performance. And these are for parameters, batch size, number of epochs, and learning rates. And this is now the table of results for the batch size um, parameter setting experiment. And based on the result, we have uh, identified batch size 64 as the best one 
as it obtained the highest F1 score, the, the, the lowest uh, top two error, and relatively uh, considerable um, computing time. Also for the learning rate, we have selected a learning rate of 0 0.0001 as it also obtains the highest uh, um, F1 score and the lowest top two error. For the number of epoch, we selected the lowest epoch as although it is um, uh, lower than the other, uh, the other parameter, but since um, we have to choose the fewest number of uh, iterations. And these are the results of the, um, the multimodal uh, deep learning uh, models by a late fusion approach. And we showed here the result of each um, uh, base learner's results. So as you can see here, um, our one of the models, which is DGC16, can um, reach up to 0.97 F1 score. And these are now the comparison of the different um, base learners that are experimented for um, hyperspectral data specific and RGB specific uh, data, data set. So we can see that VGG16 and AlexNet with MLR has produced uh, one of the highest F1 score with the lowest computational time. And hence, this is uh, superior to the other um, other uh, combinations of the base le learners. And these are statistically significant at P less than 0 0.01 using McNamara's test. And when benchmarking it with other uh, related works, so we can also observe that the our uh, method has obtained a superior and also comparative results with the existing methods like the five model late fusion and also the faster RCNN early fusion and late fusion approach and also our previous work which uh, implements feature concatenation. So in conclusion, multimodality takes advantage of the synergy when using uh, data having different but complementing modalities such as hyperspectral data and RGB images. It is further boosted with the capabilities of deep learning, which makes multimodal deep learning a great tool for non-destructive papaya fruit maturity classification. In this study, we have implemented a multimodal deep learning framework via late fusion approach for classifying fruit maturity. And this method is done without impairing the fruit because only captured hyperspectral and RGB images are used instead of slicing and spoiling it. Results show that the proposed approach is high performing and even superior to existing related studies, and it's very promising in agricultural application. Therefore, the findings of this study contributes to, to the body of knowledge of deep learning applications in agriculture like real-time in-field fruit maturity estimation. These are the references of this uh, study or this paper, and I would like to acknowledge our school, National San Yatsen University, University of the Philippines, Mindanao, and also CCE for allowing me to present this paper. Thank you very much. It's in my very interesting uh, paper about the, the application of deep learning to agriculture. So now we have some uh, minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, Anybody have uh, uh, some questions? Uh, you can raise your hand uh, and we will do the control of the microphone. So uh, in the mean, meanwhile, I have uh, some questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 why did you select this, this kind of neural networks? Uh, because uh, they, they tend to have much more trainable parameters than, for instance, residual networks. So I think that these networks are, are very heavy because they have millions of millions of parameters. And for instance, a ResNet has a much, much less uh, number of parameters. Why did you choose this kind of neural network? Thank you for that uh, interesting and very good question. So we have chosen AlexNet and VGG16 and VGG19 networks in our study 
as uh, based on the previous works like the deep roots and also the um, our previous work which uh, implements multimodal deep learning uh, uh, using feature concatenation based on that result um, the, the the residual networks and uh, the mobile net was also implemented but they they produced a um, lower performance as compared to AlexNet and VGG 16 and 19. And so those top three uh, highest performing uh, CNNs were chosen in the implementation of this study. Okay, okay, thank you. And I have another question. In your data set, is there class imbalance? Yes, uh, you can see it in my slides that there is really a class imbalance and that's why uh, in our performance evaluation, we did not uh, use the accuracy for the performance comparison, but we use the F1 score, which balances the, the um, precision and the recall um, performance measures of the algorithms. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I, I don't see any, any hand here or question. Um, I have another one. Uh, a curious question also. What kind of loss function did you use for, for train your networks? In the, the central. Yeah, uh, in the different networks, um, we use the the Adam optimizer, right? And um, for the activation function, we also use the softmax for both the the neural networks and also the multinomial logistic regression. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, now I think that that's all because uh, it's time for the next the next presentation. Thank you very much, Sim Maji. Very interesting. It's my pleasure. Work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, now uh, uh, we have the work, a comparative study with different machine learning algorithms for diabetes, diabetes disease prediction. Uh, by the authors Hafsa bin Binte Kibria, Abdul Matin, Nas Nusrat Jahan, and Sinsida Islam. Uh, so it's time for the presentation. Thank you. 15 minutes. Am I audible? Yeah, I can see the presentation. OK, um, hello everyone. Uh, it is a great opportunity and honor to present our paper in International Conference on Electrical Engineering, Computing, Science and Automatic Control. Welcome to my presentation on a comparative study with different machine learning algorithms for diabetes disease prediction. I'm a student in Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Russia University of Engineering and Technology, Bangladesh. Uh, these are the outline of the presentations. First, we'll talk about the diabetes disease, disease and machine learning algorithms. Then we'll discuss about some work that has been done on this area. Then uh, we'll talk about the objective and the methodology, methodology and the proposed approach that we used. And at last, the results and the constraints and the future work that can be possible will be discussed. So in introduction, diabetes is a set of disorders. Diabetes is a set of disorders characterized by high sugar in the blood. And it is a condition when the body stops to produce enough insulin. So the level of blood sugar increases abnormally. And then it leads to many long term diseases like heart attack, stroke. Uh, kidney failure. So it is very important to design a intelligent system that can classify diabetics early. That's why we have chosen this work to classify diabetics early using machine learning algorithms. Uh, machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. Uh, it's not like the traditional programming. It always learned from its experience. We have used three machine learning algorithms that are logistic regression, k-nearest neighbor, and support vector mesh. 
So in our work, we'll know about machine learning algorithms, the importance of machine learning in medical sector, data preprocessing steps, and the classification of diabetic studies. As we will use an intelligent system for the classification, so we will of course get a high accuracy. It will take the less medical data, so the cost will be low. Also, uh, this intelligent system will reduce the time. As the prediction is predicted early, so the death will be prevented. So uh, the, this system also reduce the death rate. Uh, now we'll discuss about some <coughs> works that has been done already. Here researchers have been used to wake a tool for the classification of diabetic disease. Four machine learning algorithms were used and here HVM performed the best. Also other machine learning algorithms like Naive Bias, Random Forest have been also used and they have used Pima Di Indian Diabetes Dataset. Um, in this work, some machine learning algorithms have been used. Also, they have used chi-square method to select the best features and improved SPM radial gave the highest accuracy. A comparative analysis has been done by support vector machine NIBAS decision tree and the highest accuracy, accuracy was 76% by NIBAS. Uh, the future work can be that it can be improved for the automation of diabetes analysis, including some other machine learning algorithms. Mm, in this work, some supervised algorithm have been used and they have used only the female Pima Indian diabetes data set, only the female patients and here logistic regression is the best performer. So this is our proposed approach. Um, there are mainly two segments here, data pre-processing and training. In data pre-processing, we first check the missing values, replace list, uh, feature scaling has been done and data partitioning was done. We have used 75% data for the training and 25% data for testing. This steps will be discussed briefly in later. And then training, we after partitioning, we have trained our models and with the trained models we have used the test data for the prediction and it keeps it is a binary classification so it gives either if the patient has diabetics or not um it is the um, it is our diabetes data set there are nine attributes total eight input attributes and one output uh, the attributes are pregnancies glucose blood pressure etc uh, this is the data set view of our system. As there are nine attributes, so we have in figure 10, we have represented the histograms of all the nine attributes and uh, uh, there are 500 samples that the patient have diabetes and 268 patients have no diabetes. Uh, we have eight, eight input attributes and uh, it is a binary classification. Uh, as I said earlier, there are some missing values in our data set. From the figure, we can see that the missing value is huge, especially in insulin, skin thickness and pregnancies. So it is not ideal to drop the values. So it will it will lost a major information. That's why we have used uh, KNN imputation to replace the missing values. KNN data imputation is the process that if a new value comes, then it uh, measures the distance of all the classes and selects the minimal distance. Here in we have say we have shown only two class, but in our model there are many class. In the value of k in our model for the imputation was five, and using only five, we have selected the minimal distance and replaced the missing values. In, in this figure, we can see that the visualization before replacing all the missing values there are many missing values, and after replacing they are all the same. Uh, feature selection is a method where the features that contribute most to the output are selected. Extra tree classifier has been used for feature selection. Um, here we can see that the glucose is the most important feature. Extra tree classifiers uh, generates a large number of decision tree and according to the voting classifier, we select which feature is the most important. The feature that gets the most votes is the most important. It means that it has the most a strong relationship towards the output. Here, glucose has the most strong relationship. We did not 
use the extracted features. We have used all the inputs in our algorithm. This is just to show which feature is important to our data set. Mm, then feature scaling is done. Uh, feature scaling is a method which is used to normalize the range of independent variables or features of data. We can see that from the figure that all the variables is from the range 0 to 1. And for feature scaling, we have used min max scalar. And then the data set was partitioned. Uh, we have used three machine learning algorithms and the hyperparameters was were tuned for all of them. And for this coding, we have used for interpretation and viewing matplotlib. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is the web application. And for library, we have used scikit-learn library and Python code was used for implementation. In this figure, we can see that the variation of accuracy of training and testing according to the K value. Uh, here we have selected K as 23 for our model as it is it gives a good accuracy for both testing and training. Mm, this is our result. Uh, the best accuracy for testing we have got from logistic logistic regression. KNN also gave a good accuracy of 82% and uh, precision recall F1 is also good for the other algorithms. These are the confusion metrics for our three algorithms. Mm, receiver operating characteristic curve has been shown. The first is for the KNN and the second figure is for logistic regression and the third is for support vector machine. Here also logistic regression gave the best, which is 79%. Uh, this is our comparison chart of all the algorithms. So to compare other works with our models, some recent works have been shown. Many researchers used many different algorithms for the classification of diabetic disease. In those experiments, they have used artificial neural networks, exibus, support vector machine, naive pairs, etc. Mm, the context can be said that that more better approach, like we can use some hybrid models for better accuracy. Hybrid models means that two or three models fusion to get a better result and other algorithms can also be applied for a better performance. In future, we are planning to use those algorithms to classify other diseases as well and also fusion models can be used. A future real world application of such work can be a mobile application, a web based platform for physicians where patient information will be updated. Uh, these are the reference that I have used. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hafsa, for your work. Very interesting. Uh, we have some minutes for some questions from the audience. Um, please, if anyone anyone wants to, to ask something, raise your hand or write your question in the chat, please. OK, I, I have uh, two questions in the meantime. First, uh, can you talk about the process for tuning the hyperparameters of your classifiers? Uh, the, for instance, the C value of the SVM or the number of, of nearest neighbors of the key K and N. How did you uh, make that uh, tuning process? Okay, um, for SVM, we have used the value of C as 10 and also for logistic regression or the regularization parameter, C was taken as 100. In SVM, both gamma and C was tuned and checked which value gives us the better performance. And for K and N, we have um, use the range of k value to see on which k value we have get a best accuracy and that was 23. OK, and also um, it's, it's very interesting the, the behavior of your uh, classifiers. And why, uh, why do you think that a linear classifier like logistic regression all performance in general, the nonlinear classifiers, ESVM and KNN? Why do you think that it happened? 
Mm, as it is a binary classification problem, SVM, especially logistic regression, is very good at classifying binary problem, and our data set is more likely linearly separable, and it becomes so easy for them to get a good accuracy for that data set. Okay, okay. Well, uh, is so somebody has a question? Anybody? There are there are no questions in the chat. Okay, okay. Thank you, Samuel. So, uh, okay, Hassa, uh, I think that uh, we we can finish now. Uh, it's a very interesting okay. work. And, thank you. And thank you very much. And we can move now for the next presentation. Uh, the 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 title of the next presentation is a no a novel hybrid gene selection based on random forest approach and binary dragonfly algorithm. Uh, this is by the authors Sajet Pedran uh, and Elnas Pashae. Uh, okay, Sajet, are you ready? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning, we, thank, we you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, can you see their page? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I can see. OK, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to propose our paper. And uh, thank you. Uh, now, uh, my name is uh, Sayed Pedram Hoeri, and uh, I'm uh, from uh, Sambul Aydin University. And uh, this is my paper, uh, which is about a uh, novel hybrid gene selection based on random forest approach and uh, binary dragonfly algorithm. Uh, the contents uh, of this presentation is uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the introduction and the details about the feature selection tax. Uh, next, uh, I want to talk about the random forest ranking and details about it. And then uh, I will talk about the binary dragon dragonfly algorithm and uh, the details about the concepts of uh, BDA. After that, I uh, completely propose our method and the application of uh, random forest and the binary dragonfly algorithm for feature selection. And finally, I will show you our experimental result and investigate the performance of our proposed method. And now let's go to the introduction to feature selection part. Uh, first of all, uh, I should mention that within the field of machine learning, there are three main types of uh, feature selection methods, uh, filter approach, wrapper approach, and embedded approach. And uh, the uh, aim of the feature selection task is to process of uh, selecting a subset of uh, relevant features. And uh, using the feature selection, we can eliminate the redundant, irrelevant, and noisy data from the microarray data set. Uh, the purpose of uh, the purpose of uh, feature selection is reducing the memory consumption, uh, decreasing the time complexity, and uh, increasing the chance of finding optimal solutions and uh, eliminating redundant and irrelevant uh, features. And finally, reducing dimensionality and uh, removing noisy features from our data set. Now I want to talk about the random forest ranking, the method which I use uh, in our purpose method. The important characteristics of random forest are it is uh, highly variable, adaptable, and suitable for various microarray classification. Also it, is use, uh, also, it is useful for analyzing a large or a small problems, and uh, we can apply it in both simple and complicated classification, and also we can use it for selecting and ranking the features based on the importance of genes. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, we can use it uh, for both binary and multiple classification. And uh, the last but uh, uh, very important uh, uh, characteristic of random forest is that the necessity of. Oh. Uh, the necessity of uh, parameter tuning for the random forest is uh, not mandatory. Uh, now let's talk sorry, about. The sorry. sorry. So sorry, your your screen is is black now. I, I cannot see your now. Now I can see your, your screen, but your presentation is is, is not uh, in the screen now. Uh, 
uh, this is my problem or uh, uh, Okay, I we, yeah, yeah, I can see your presentation now. Okay. Sorry. Uh, not a problem. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, let's talk about the binary neuron fly algorithm, which is called the BDA. Uh, this algorithm is inspired by the behavior of uh, dragonflies in their living environment. And uh, the life mechanism of dragonflies include two major parts. The first part is the hunting mechanism, which is called uh, a static swarm, in which the dragonflies fly in uh, small groups over a small area to, ser to search uh, for a food sources. And the second part is the migration mechanism, uh, which is called a dynamic swarm. In this, uh, in this mechanism, the dragonflies fly in a large groups along one direction that should be opposite of the enemy's location. The dragonflies' behavior generally includes five independent patterns, uh, which we use these uh, five independent patterns to formulate our uh, binary dragonfly algorithm. Uh, separation, which refers to the individual, should stay away from other neighboring. Alignment, uh, which refers to the individual, match their velocity with the other neighbor. And the cohesion, which uh, refers to the tendency of individuals to fly toward the neighbor. And the attraction, which uh, they should fly toward the food source. And finally, the distraction, which refers to the tendency of uh, dragonflies to fly away from an enemy. And uh, the dragonfly uh, dragonflies procedure is uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, the binary dragonfly gives a vector of zeros and one. The zero indicates that the corresponding feature is not selected, and one indicates that the corresponding feature is selected. Finally, the naive bias classifier evaluates the selected feature subset. And in the last part, uh, the fitness function uh, considers the classification accuracy and the number of selected genes. Uh, now, the, this is our purpose method, and uh, I want to explain it uh, for you. Uh, our purpose method is uh, RFR PDA algorithm. Uh, we propose a novel hybrid method uh, based on random forest ranking as a filter approach and the binary dragonfly algorithm as a wrapper approach. Uh, the aim of is, uh, this work is to enhance the classification accuracy and decrease the number of selected genes. Uh, it should be noted that there are two major parts uh, there are two major parts as follows, uh, random forest part and BDA part. In the random forest part, uh, we employed the uh, random forest to eliminate irrelevant and redundant genes from the microarray dataset. Then ranks all of the genes and the best end top uh, features are selected. Then the output of this uh, stage is a new gene subset, uh, which is uh, produced by the random forest. And uh, the huge number of genes are numerously reduced. Uh, after that, uh, we applied our uh, algorithm, uh, binary dragonfly, and uh, to the reduced data subset to select the best features. Uh, the search strategy is BDA, and the evaluator for the selected genes is the naive uh, bias classifier. Uh, finally, the, classif uh, the classification accuracy is evaluated by using the naive bias classifier. And uh, as an output, uh, after two feature selection part, the significant and relevant genes are selected and the classification performance is improved. Now I want to show you the experimental results part. Um, we use this function as our fitness function. And uh, as you can see, we have uh, two parameters, alpha and beta. Alpha determines the weight of classification accuracy, and beta determines the weight of the features selection rate. And you can see the value of these parameters. And maybe you have this question, why we use this uh, value for the alpha and beta? Uh, we calculate and uh, we calculate the effect of alpha and beta parameters of our, on our algorithm. And you can see we use different parameters such as uh, 0.5 for alpha and 0.5 for beta, and uh, this is the no, uh, this is the value. And you can see uh, with this uh, with this value uh, 0.99 and 0.01, we use the highest performance of our algorithm, which is the accuracy is around 100, and the selection rate is. Uh, 0.4, which is the minimum selection rate, is a, a good performance, and we should uh, have a highest uh, accuracy. 
Uh, in our purpose method, we use the four different data sets, leukemia 1, leukemia 2, SRBCT, and lung cancer. Uh, these data sets have a, a different uh, number of instances, different number of features, and different number of classes. Then, uh, in the first step, we apply our random forest ranking to this data set, and we used uh, uh, four different classifiers, SVM, random forest, KNN, and naive bias and we compared the result of this, uh, uh, this uh, classifier together. And as you can see, uh, the NAPIOS have achieved a better performance in compared to the other classifiers. And uh, also it should be noted that we uh, use different uh, value of N top selected genes, for example, 5, 50, and 100. Then we compare our uh, filter approach with the other filter approach. And uh, we uh, compare random forest, our purpose, with the uh, relief, MRMR, and uh, one of these papers purpose their own uh, filter, and uh, which is our reference it, uh, into this table. And as you can see, uh, our purpose method uh, in the filter approach achieved a better performance in compared to the other uh, filter approach. Then we apply our binary dragon fly and complete complete package of our uh, purpose method with the different uh, meta heuristic algorithm. Uh, such as uh, genetic algorithm, particle swarm optimization, ant colony optimization, and differential evolution. And uh, as you can see, in all of the data set, our purpose method achieved a better performance in accuracy and in the number of selected genes. For example, in the leukemia one, we achieved the 100 uh, accuracy with, uh, with only four features. But uh, you can see the other uh, algorithms such as a genetic algorithm and this accuracy and, for example, with uh, 19 genes. But uh, our purpose method achieved the minimum number of genes, uh, which is uh, a, a better performance. Uh, after that, uh, to uh, confirm the result of our purpose method, we compare uh, random forest uh, ranking and BDA with the other hybrid approach. Uh, and as you can see in the table, uh, our purpose method achieved a better result, and uh, you can compare our uh, results with the other methods. And, uh, uh, in both accuracy and number of selected genes. Uh, our purpose method uh, achieved a better accuracy while it uh, achieved the minimum number of selected genes. Uh, now uh, let's uh, go to the conclusion part and uh, if I want to uh, uh, state some of the main contribution of our paper is that uh, the proposing of uh, uh, random forest and uh, BDA uh, algorithm for solving feature selection problems, then the purpose method improved the performance of classification accuracy, while the purpose method reduced the number of selected genes. And uh, the purpose algorithm selects the most uh, significant and informative genes from the thousand number of genes which uh, data set contains. And uh, the purpose algorithm is not too complex. And uh, finally, uh, the purpose algorithm outperforms all the other uh, feature selection algorithm. Uh, finally, thank you so much. And uh, if I, uh, if you have any question, I'm glad to help. Bosh, Sajid, it's it's a very interesting paper about the, the application of, of these uh, metaheuristics and, and classifiers to to feature selection problem. So, so now we have some some minutes for questions. Uh, we have. Okay. You can wait here in the in the chat, or the, the audience can raise your hand. Uh, we have um, I can see here in the chat a uh, uh, question. Okay, uh, from Sinmaji. It, it, it says she said, uh, "Thank you, Sayed. This is a great presentation and study too. You obtain superior accuracy of your proposed methods." How is the computational time of your algorithm? Uh, I answer it. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can. Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, about the computational time, uh, I should mention that uh, our algorithm is too fast and too, uh, uh, too quick. But uh, because of the limited page uh, for the conference, uh, we cannot uh, put it in a, uh, this paper. But uh, if I want to state it, uh, we can say it's uh, so quick and it's have a better performance, uh, for example, with the algorithm we compared. For example, the genetic algorithm or ACO, uh, we calculate it and it has a, a better performance in the time complexity also. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody has another question? I have some questions. Uh, in, in the, my, my first question is, what is the average number of genes in the data sets that you use? Uh, I couldn't address. Uh -huh. what, what is the average number of genes uh, in, the, in the data sets that you use? Um, uh, the dimensionality, the approximated uh, dimensionality of your data sets? Uh, yes, uh, for example, I used uh, four different data sets in our uh, paper, and uh, we can say, uh, uh, for example, in the leukemia, we have uh, 72 instances, and with, uh, for example, 7,000 genes. And uh, we tried, uh, and also the leukemia to is 11,225 uh, number of genes. And because of this reason, uh, we, I tried to choose a different variety of number of genes to uh, make a fair comparison. For example, the, uh, the SRBCT data set only 2,000 number of genes, but on the other hand, lung cancer has uh, 12,000 number of genes. Okay. And uh, after that, we, uh, for example, with the random forest, we only uh, 50 top genes. And after that, we apply the BDA algorithm to select the most relevant and important genes from it. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, uh, now, um, what do you uh -huh. think that what are the advantages presented by the Dragonfly algorithm over the classic uh, metaheuristics? Uh, what advantages mm. do you think uh, it, it has because it performed the, the other metaheuristics? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I should uh, mention that the uh, BDA algorithm is one of the most strong and uh, recently algorithm, and uh, I choose it, but I should mention that I choose another uh, metaheuristic algorithm, but the BDA shows it's a better performance in compared to the other algorithm. Uh, for example, in the first of all, in the time complexity, it has too quick. And also, on the, head, on the other hand, it uh, requires a minimum number of parameter tuning, which uh, with uh, a minimum number of parameter tuning, we can achieve the highest performance of binary dragonfly. But on the other hand, there are many uh, metaheuristic algorithms that need a uh, high amount of uh, parameter tuning, and uh, we should focus on it. But uh, BDA is too simple, and also it uh, doesn't need a uh, high amount of uh, parameter tuning. OK, OK, thank you. And um, I have uh, another one question. Uh, how many trees uh, were considered in the random forest? Uh, how many trees? The number of trees in the random forest. Uh, how did you define it? How, how, how number of trees? Uh, I, I should mention that I uh, choose a different number of tree for uh, the random forest, but uh, the uh, 10 is uh, give us the better result in compared to the other uh, number of trees. For example, I choose the 5, uh, 10, 15, 10, and 10. 20, but the 10 is uh, give me a better performance in compared to the other classifier or other uh, feature uh, ranking approach. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I am here watching if, if anybody has a question. No, I, we don't have questions in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Sajet. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, your conference and uh, for giving this uh, opportunity to uh, present our work. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We, we can... And move on to the next presentation. Um, the number of the, the name of the paper is quantitative comparison of edge based and region based feature detection in digital area imagery analysis, which uh, is presented by Seng Mao Ye. Okay, uh, thank you, Seng Mao. Uh, now we can hear your presentation. You have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, good morning. Can you uh, can you see the slides? 
Yeah, I can see. Yeah. OK, that's how I will start. Good morning. So this presentation is about the quantitative comparison of edge based and region based feature detection in digital image analysis. A quick outline. The focus of this paper is on quantitative analysis in spatial domain, in frequency domain, as well as the dynamic range and the, among different type of the like, uh, detection technique. Basically, we have both the region detection and the edge detection. So a little bit about myself. And I'm an EE professor at Southern University. My research interest covered control and optimization with diverse applications on electrical, mechanical, automotive, and the biomedical system, as well as signal and image processing. So introduction. The digital image segmentation focuses on segmentations of one or more features in an image based on a certain similarity or based on the discontinuity criterion. So it's unavoidable that for the error image to be contaminated by the artifacts and noises. And that therefore it causes the actual blurry boundary, intensity, inhomogeneity, and high complexity. And both the edge and the region-based feature detection are broadly used for the segmentation. Also, Numerous comparisons between the two have already been made. But all those comparisons are based on qualitative analysis. The conclusion is thus lack of the convincing data-driven evidence instead. And instead, in this like I say, article, the systematic quantitative analysis approach has been proposed to compare two dominating feature detection techniques. Okay. And both the RTBM model and HS, uh, HSI model will be applied. And uh, in terms of our frequency domain and uh, like I said, like uh, uh, spatial domain analysis. Now, specifically, we will choose like three popular image segmentation scheme, namely candy edge detection, cable edge detection, and the kernel FCM. So a useful set of a quantitative information matrix has also been introduced, such as a discrete entropy, mutual information, and contrast dynamic range, and so on. So let's take a look of the uh, two color space at first. From the theory of uh, identity, uh, like a color vision, and the actual color is a mixture of RGB component in 3D condition system. So RGB is simply defined inside the cube with the red, green, blue as the three primary color aspects. Each one has the range between 0 and 255, that is 8 bit. Now the RGB color representation consists of six uh, like a high C decimal bits. Black and white are located on two corners of a main diagonal. The projection of RGB component to the main diagonal simply gives rise to the gray level. On the other hand, and uh, similar to the human visual sense of our colors, HSI model is also uh, like a popular. Each color has a three component and uh, the hue angle, color saturation intensity. Now the hue component uses the angle to describe the color itself. So it has a range between zero and two pi. For example, zero is used for the red, and the, uh, like one third of pi is used for yellow. For both the saturation and the inner, uh, like in intensity, they have another range between zero and one. And uh, like I said, like for the intensity like range, basically it limits the saturation. Well, like I say, two color spaces are interchangeable, so both spaces are popular in machine vision. So let's take a look at the first scheme, and we will use the first one is uh, being used is a uh, like I said, like a classical adaptive cutting edge detection. OK, and the main purpose and the, the cutting edge algorithm and the detects the edge based the zero crossing of a directional second order derivative. OK, so it's used the optimal smoothing filter. Eventually, the digital image has been smoothed via the Gaussian convolution. OK, both the edge strength and the edge direction can be expressed as uh, like a uh, gradient mag magnitude and the gradient like a direction. After like a two-dimensional uh, spatial uh, like, uh, uh, spatial gradient has been computed, eventually the edge is located at a local optimum of the first order derivative for the smooth image in the direction of a gradient magnitude. It also acts as the zero crossing point of second order derivative. Okay, so after that, and the edge direction is simply like being classified into one of the eight evenly distributed angles between zero and the two pi. And in order to show the vertical, horizontal, and the diagonal directions. After that, 
the non-maximum surprising is applied. And in order to, like I said, like connect the broken, uh, like bro broken edge. So here we have adaptive edge check and uh, it has been applied uh, via the eight connectivity chain code. A digital curve can then be formulated as the integer like a uh, in, uh, sequence instead. So this is the first scheme uh, like, uh, we focus on. The second edge detection uh, scheme and uh, is a practical one, is a, a 2D Gaber wavelets. The Gaber uh, filter consists of a, a, like a complex sign carrier and a Gaussian envelope. For the two-dimensional case, the spatial domain Gaber filter also acts as the Gaussian kernel function modulated by the sign plane wave. Okay, so this filter is nothing but the product of a complex sign function and the elliptical uh, Gaussian function. Now simply, like we have the like first equation, very simple, right over here. Okay, so now we have our like I said, like, uh, the Gaber filter being designed and uh, being formulated as a product of term in the like a product of two terms in the spatial domain. After the Gaber wavelet and uh, like a transform has been applied, then we also have our frequency domain. So basically, this wavelet analysis is like conversion between the spatial domain and the like I said, like a frequency domain. And in this like a set of like uh, equations, we also have a sigma x and sigma y. Simply, they represent the standard deviations in the x and y coordinate. We also have a u0 and v0, they are the spatial frequency. Now, after like I said, like, uh, we uh, formulate our like I say, Gaber like a wavelet like a function in the spatial domain already. We can also convert it to the like I said, like uh, the uh, frequency domain. So using the convolution and the corresponding like I said, equation in the frequency domain has been formulated as another to a couple of equations. Well, now we have a sigma, a sigma u and a sigma v. They represent the standard deviation in the u and the v coordinate instead. So like in, uh, like in, uh, in practical implementation, and the two operations will be made, rotation and the deletion, okay? So like eventually we can generate a 2D like a Gaber wavelets. So here we will introduce the two, two factor. The first one we call the scalar factor. The scalar factor has been defined as s equal to alpha to the power of a negative small case m. Okay, alpha must be like a uh, like a bigger than uh, than one. We also introduce the phase factor, which is the defined as a state right over here. And uh, like the phase factor represents the orientation of the sign like a say plane wave. Now, like I said, like in these like I said, like, uh, formulas, and uh, we have capital M and a capital N. They represent the total number of uh, scales and orientations. So for each individual, like I said, like a uh, level of the discrete waveform and the uh, wave, uh, wave rate transfer, and the alpha right here, if alpha has been selected as a two, then eventually it simply generate two by two uh, quadrant like a blocks with a uh, four sub uh, bands instead. Now, we can like uh, go further because nowadays people already like uh, use uh, some other technique and uh, like the optimal uh, Gaber filter as well as the Gaber wave uh, like a wavelet pyramid. So like I said, they are further expansion of like a 2D Gaber filter. Well, the former one, uh, the former is based on the parametric optimization, and the latter produce a low and high resolution by both the down sampling and the up sampling. Well, for comparison purpose, we just uh, use the classical Gaber uh, like, wavelet rather than the opti uh, optimal uh, like I said, uh, Gaber filter and the Gaber uh, wavelet pyramid. So we talk about the uh, edge detection techniques being used already. The next nice one turns up the region detection technique. Okay, the most famous one, I believe, that turns up the Faraday Siemens clustering. So right now we use the kernel-based FCM and to represent the uh, region-based detection. For any uh, K-means clustering, each cluster data set through K number of clusters. Okay, then we introduce the Faraday logic. So any pixel belongs to the uh, multi, uh, multiple cluster with certain degree of belongings. The summation of a family membership simply is always equal to one. Okay, so now, like I said, like, uh, we we can calculate the kernel distance and uh, which uh, like uh, where, like I said, the Gaussian kernel right here has been selected and uh, be, uh, being shown like uh, in this uh, formula. The center of the cluster is also the mean of all points weighted by the family membership itself. The degree of belonging is related to the inverse of a distance of matrix to the cluster center. Okay, so now it's also uh, being normalized and fortified with certain parameters like a uh, small case M is a greater than one. 
So eventually, we, intro, uh, we need to introduce a certain performance, like an index, or sim simply the cost function. So for our case, there is, like I said, like a, a cost function is easily, uh, is easily built. Okay. So we simply use this function to represent the like, a Faraday cost function in order to minimize, like I said, like, uh, uh, this function itself. Well, here we also introduce, like I said, like, uh, like uh, the data matrix. Well, XJ is uh, nothing but uh, like these elements of a Faraday matrix. Okay. So for each uh, iteration itself, the both the Faraday membership and the, like I said, like a cluster centers will be updated. Okay. Until the cost function has been minimized to reach the optimal segmentation. So now, we have the theoretical part of our, like I said, like, uh, our research. Now take a look of the numerical simulations. We introduce a three typical digital area image. Okay, the bird eye views of a real genero, and the Machu Picchu and the Cape Town, and the both the edge uh, based edge detection and region based detection are implemented. The classical candy edge detection and the practical Gaber edge detection are both used to generate the edge-based detection outcomes. Instead, the kernel Faraday Siemens clustering with the three, five, and ten clusters members are used to generate the region-based detection outcomes. Okay, so this, like I said, like, uh, the quantitative analysis and uh, will be conducted in the uh, frequency domain, in spatial domain, as well as, like I said, like a dynamic range analysis. So let's take a look of the like I said, like, uh, the simulation result at the first. And uh, we have like uh, this page, and we have a uh, three source image. All of those turns out to be the digital error image. Well, if you use the candy edge, like I said, like, uh, detection, and it generate the three result on the second row. Well, if we use the like a uh, Gaber edge detection, it generate like uh, like uh, the result in the third like uh, row. Okay, so this turns out to be the comparison like uh, from the like a uh, visual perspective. Well, let's take a look at some others. If you use like I uh, say FJ FCM, and then what happens right here is, and uh, we have a uh, three cluster case, and the uh, five cluster case, and the uh, ten cluster case, and obviously, and uh, from the uh, like I uh, said, uh, from the uh, visual observation. We already we can see some difference right over here. Okay, but anyway, like I said, the qualitative analysis is not the focus of our research, and we want to, like I say, have the data driven results. That's the reason we have to introduce a quantitative analysis. Okay, so now, like I said, like in particular, the frequency domain analysis and the spatial spatial domain analysis will be based on the RGB model. And the dynamic range analysis will be based on the HSI model. Both will be implemented. Comparison on computation time itself are relatively simple, but now the focus of the race uh, research once again. So I just have a quick comparison. Well, uh, suppose we have a fixed resolution, and uh, for the same image with the fixed resolution, and it can we can show like a simple example. Okay. In general, the like I said, like uh, the edge detection is a more time efficient than region detection. Okay, let's take a look for the same image. Okay, and uh, the computation time being formulated in seconds. Okay, so we have a uh, two edge based like a uh, detection, candy edge and the uh, Gaber edge, and the one like uh, needs like a uh, three second, the other one eighteen second. However, if we focus on the like uh, the region based uh, like a uh, measure, and uh, it's up to almost 400 seconds if you see like a 10 cluster right over here. So that's we can make a simple conclusion. And here actually the edge detection is like I said, more time efficient. But let's take a, uh, take a look of the most important part of uh, like I said, like this research. Okay, we will introduce the like a quantitative analysis in frequency domain at first. So specifically, we will introduce the uh, discrete entropy, discrete energy and the mutual information. So what are they? And uh, the discrete entropy and uh, so as the average uncertainty of uh, information shots. It has been defined as the summation of products between the probability of outcome and the log of the inverse of, of the probability. The di discrete energy can also show how intensity level of uh, each primary color channel is distribu distributed. So discrete energy has used to indicate the uh, randomness, uh, randomness as well. For mutual information, that is another important metric. So the information that Y can tell about X is also equal to the uncertainty reduction of X due to the existence of Y. 
when, like I say, two images are totally independent, what happens right here is the mutual information is simply equal to zero. OK, so now, like I say, we have a three set of the, like I say, like, uh, the, like uh, information matrix outcome based on the quantitative analysis. Well, based on three cases and the, the same conclusion can be made. So we just have a summary. So now the source image always have the largest uh, like a district uh, discrete uh, like a entropy, followed by the like I said like a uh, KC uh, like a uh, case uh, like a uh, KCM and the further uh, like I said like a uh, uh, further seeming clustering with uh, ten clusters, five clusters. Well, like I said like uh, the edge detection and the like I said the entropy is uh, between like I say FCM clustering of a five cluster and the, like a three cluster. So now, like I say, we can make the first simple conclusion. Cutting edge detection produces the smallest discrete entropy. In that case, it also contains the least amount of information. Well, the source image does contain the maximum amount of information. The Gaber edge detection even shows more information than region-based FCM and with a small cluster number, like a three. Furthermore, and we have the source image have the smallest uh, discrete and uh, like energy, but the maximum amount of information followed by the like I said, like FCM with a 10 cluster, FCM with a five cluster, Gable edge detection, and the FCM with a three cluster. So the cutting edge detection produced the largest value of a discrete entropy, corresponding to least amount of information once again. The Gaber like, edge detection produced a, a like, smaller energy, but so small information and region based current, like, uh, FCM with a small cluster number. Now, the third important, like I said, like, uh, like, uh, matrix we talk about is a mutual information. Now, simply, we need to compare the mutual information and uh, together, like I said, like, uh, with the source image. OK, the cutting edge detection produced the smallest mutual information, followed by the uh, like, uh, Gaber edge detection and the KCM with a three cluster, five cluster, and 10 cluster. Now, it simply manifests that edge detection outcomes generate uh, so less dependency on the source image than region detection outcomes. So now we finish the quant uh, quantitative analysis in this, uh, like a frequency domain. Of course, this one is uh, not complete, right? We also need to, like I said, like find out the quantitative analysis uh, like a result based uh, on the spatial domain analysis. So now what happens right here is the information matrix being covered uh, like a homogeneity, contrast, and the dissimilarity. The co-occurrence matrix has been introduced. It is a matrix which is relevant to distribution of either the grayscale value or RGB individual color components and uh, in the row and the columns of a digital image. So what is a dissimilarity being defined? It depends on the local distance representation between any two digital images. The homogeneity, in fact, is the direct measure of the local variations of a digital image. And the, regarding the contrast, it is a matrix to, uh, like I said, like, uh, to measure the variations of intensity distribution across the, each channel. So those three will be applied right here. And here we have, like I said, like a three set of data. Okay. And uh, like, uh, here, like we find out, and uh, the similar conclusion can be made once again. So here is a quick summary. OK. The cutting edge detection gave rise to the lowest homogeneity, followed by the far seeming clustering with a 10 cluster and the 5 cluster, the source image and the like a, uh, like a, uh, FCM with a 3 cluster. And well, the Gaber edge detection here gave rise to highest homogeneity than uh, like anything else. The source image and the kernel FCM and have the homogeneity values between the cutting edge detection and the Gable edge detection. But it's a surprising, say, like uh, the edge the, like, uh, detection could pr provide either the highest structure uh, uh, variations or the lowest structure analysis. Well, for the region detection and the structure uh, like, uh, variation is uh, located between, like I say, two typical edge detection technique. For the kernel KCM, it can produce a different structure variations according to the cluster number, smaller than that of source uh, like, uh, image with the low cluster number, but larger than that of the source like, say, like, uh, image at, like I say, with the large cluster number case. So the cutting edge detection also leads to the highest contrast and this uh, similarity, followed by the KCM with the 10 cluster, 5 cluster, and the source image as well as the KC, uh, FCM with the three, like, say, like, uh, uh, three cluster. 
The Gaber edge detection leads to the lowest contrast and uh, a dissimilarity, corresponding to the smallest intensity difference and the spatial difference. So this is, is a major advantage. The kernel KCM and the uh, cluster clustering and uh, like, uh, produce the smaller, uh, smaller intensity uh, difference and the spatial difference than that of the source image with a low cluster number, but the larger intensity difference and the spatial difference than that of the source image with uh, at, uh, like I said, uh, larger like uh, cluster number. So now we finish like uh, the quantitative analysis in the spatial domain and also in the like I said, like, uh, the frequency domain. But both of those are focused on the uh, like RGB model. If you like I said, like uh, use the HSI model instead, we have to use a quantitative analysis based on another uh, important matrix we call dynamic range. The RTB model can be converted to the HSI model directly. Okay, especially the intensity can be easily formulated, which turns up the average of the RTB like a component in three channels. Now we have a dynamic range being defined by this uh, equation. It shows us the ratio of the largest measurable intensity level to the smallest detectable intensity level in digital image. By convention, the maximum in intensity is also uh, is always relevant to the saturation. Well, the minimal one is reached at a noise level. And here, actually, like I said, we just use a single like I said, image and to like I said, like, uh, uh, present this result because like uh, like uh, the result uh, across a different case are quite similar. Without the loss of a generality and uh, right now, like uh, based on the like, one single uh, error image, uh, digital image, and uh, we have the following result. Okay. And uh, the kernel of uh, like FCM with uh, three clusters and it ju just uh, generate the dynamic range about uh, 3.9. Okay. Well, like I say, cutting edge detection gave rise to 6.5, and the uh, Gaber edge pro uh, like, uh, produced a 6.7. And the uh, like, uh, uh, kernel of FCM and the uh, with the five cluster produced a 9.5, and the uh, like uh, like, say, like uh, uh, with a 10 cluster it has the 9.57. But eventually the source image has the broadest like uh, dynam dynamic range among this list. Okay, that is about 9.57 uh, 79. So like when we have a, a FCM with the like a high cluster numbers, then this re, like a result is a quite similar to the like I said like uh, the uh, dynamic range of a source image. But anyway, and we know like the edge-based detection has the measurable intensity level with like within the region-based like I said like uh, detection with a different cluster numbers. Now based on like I said like uh, this type of the analysis, okay. So neither the edge-based detection, now the region, be, uh, like I said, like a detection takes the dominating role in feature detection from the quantitative analysis. But uh, sometimes, you know, we need a trade-off. Okay, when detection accuracy and the computation complexity are both taken into account. Okay, what happens right here is the Gabriel edge detection and the kernel FCM clustering with the like appropriate cluster number, for example, five. They can produce the better overall feature extraction outcomes than others. What? One more minute, please. Okay, so sure. Conclusion. Okay, thanks. So instead of a qualitative visual observations, the uh, like a quantitative comparison are systematically conducted among outcomes from multiple edge detection and the region detection approaches. Information matrix are selected in both the spatial domain and the frequency domain with respect to RTB model and HS model. So in frequency domain analysis, although the edge detection outcomes so less dependency on the source image than the region detection outcomes in general, it is possible that edge detection, like the Gaber filter, produced outcome with more information than region detection schemes. In spatial domain analysis, the role of edge detection is more significant, where the Gaber edge detection could generate the lowest structure variations and the contrast, but the cutting edge detection can generate the highest structure variations and contrast. The lastly, and in the dynamic range analysis, the source image has the highest measurable intensity level. Well, the edge detection has the least measurable intensity level than region detection with the high cluster numbers. Finally, as a trade-off, the Gaber detection and the uh, kernel FCM and the, like I said, like, uh, with the five cluster provide a relatively better overall performance in feature detection than others. This, this discover, uh, discovery can be further extended to the complex uh, multi-spectral and the hyperspectral imagery analysis. So that's the end of uh, like, uh, my presentation and uh, the reference being used and has been listed in these slides. 
So now I'd like to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Very much. Uh, we have uh, two minutes for questions. Is anybody in the audience has a question for for Saint Mao? Uh, you can write your question in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, I have a, a question. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, okay. Did you consider the structural similarity index? Uh, this index, it, yeah, it involves uh, luminance, contrast, and structure measures. Uh, did you consider it for your evaluations? Uh, okay, in that evaluation, I only consider the intensity itself. Because like I said, like, R, like R, uh, for the uh, dynamic range, its definition is uh, irrelevant to other terms, okay? So basically, like I only focus on the intensity in the HSI model right now. Okay, but in future we can do some uh, like work based on that. Okay, and 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 for future future work, did you consider other uh, color spaces instead of uh, HSI color space? For instance, YCBR. Uh, I don't know. I think like I said, like, color space. Yeah. For the okay. similar, like, say, like uh, for the uh, similar uh, image side, and uh, like uh, we can do like some actual work based on other models. And uh, so far, and uh, our focus is uh, like uh, on two models. RGB actually is uh, like according to the Cartesian system, so everybody can use it. For the H uh, HSI, basically, is a fo follow the hum human uh, like I say, like uh, visual sense. That's the reason we select the two model right here. But this okay. work is just a preliminary work, of course, and we will have the further like a study on some other uh, like I say, like uh, color models. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, it's time now for, for uh, move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Sigma. Okay, thank you. Interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. Now uh, is uh, the next work in this paper. Uh, the title is "Effect of Rate of Change of Stock Prices with New New Sentiment Analysis." Uh, the authors are Sashank Suridar and So Mai. Sanangabapurts, excuse me by my pronunciation. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, you, you okay. can now start your presentation, please. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, I, I can see your presentation. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Sashank. I'm from College of Engineering, Indi, Anna University, India. I'll be presenting our paper, Effect of Rate of Change of Stock Prices with New Sentiment Analysis. Stock, uh, stock market involves companies selling their stocks where every individual can buy enough capital of that company and claim an ownership within that company. For determining which stocks to invest in, uh, users can take over a variety of macroeconomic factors. One such uh, factor is news. News is capable of shaping and influencing the emotions and opinions of people. Investors would like to have an educated uh, introduction on each stock before they actually perform their investments. To perform this, they go through various news headlines and articles to gain an idea on how good the stock investment would be. Sentiment analysis or opinion mining is the NLP process of identifying the polarity of these headlines to check whether they are positive, negative or neutral and to determine whether the investment would be successful or not. Random forests are a class of ensemble models which are machine learning algorithms that help to determine this sentiment analysis. This is done by splitting the nodes based on the best performing feature and trying to uh, uh, identify the sentiment analysis of the news headlines. They add certain randomness and, uh, to the data, thereby reducing the bias and increasing the variance and prevents overfitting of data. To model the prices, we can use any recurrent neural network. The RNN which we choose here is the bidirectional long short term memory. It involves modeling the prices both in forward and reverse directions and helps to identify the features within the data. So the overall architecture that we have built here is a multitask architecture. Multitask architecture involves subtasks which are being solved in order to finally solve a major task. Each of the subtasks which are uh, performed here is 
manipulating the uh, prices in order to identify how the prices change as well as identification the uh, identification of the sentiment of news articles and we categorize it as both positive as well as negative sentiment and hence we come up with three sub tasks which can be solved finally the major task which is the meta classifier involves solving the price prediction or finding out the rate of change of prices based on previous history so this is the overall multitask architecture so the data set which we have used is the, the dow jones industrial average data set it comprises of extracting of the stock prices for 30 large companies on the stock market in the united states corresponding to each of these 30 companies we also extracted the news articles for each day between the period of 8 august 2008 to 1st july 2016 the headlines were scraped from reddit and are ranked up to 25 based on user votes the data which is extracted for the prices involve open high low close adjusted close prices as well as the volume of the stocks traded for each article which was scraped uh, the polarity of that particular article is assigned a zero when there is a decrease in the closing price of the stock compared to the previous day and one when the close price stayed the same or increased compared to the previous day so the first step in pre-processing the data step was in uh, normalization the stock prices were first normalized by using min max scalar and then we perform a sequential time series analysis this was done by constructing a sliding window of n days to form the input sequence and the n plus one day form the output sequence similarly for predicting new sentiment analysis the headlines were cleaned to ensure there are no null embeddings present then tf idf scores were calculated and a random forest model was built the random forest model predicts the probability of positive sentiment score as well as the negative sentiment score finally the sentiment scores were also sequentialized that is put into a sliding window to correspond to the sliding window of the prices as seen in this figure so the multitask model involves solving two different subtasks independently and tries to collaborate the learnings by using a meta classifier so the multitask model which is built here can predict either the rate of change of prices as well as the stock actual stock price itself the subtasks involve modeling the prices involving modeling the each of the positive as well as the negative sentiments of the new set lines so as i said before the new set lines are modeled model by using random forest and the prices are modeled by using by lstms by lstms are used in comparison to lstms because lstms can only find out the prices in the forward direction whereas by lstms are able to model the sequence in both the forward and the reverse direction this helps it to find out both the future data as well as the past data in the time sequence the meta classifier which is used here is a basic ann which helps to model both the uh, probabilities as well as the prices together and forms a two level optimization of the input data the implementation is done on google collab so uh, the sentiment analysis model has uh, 25 new headlines for each day corresponding to uh, 8 august 2008 to 1st july 2016 similarly the price data has closing prices uh, as well as the rate of change of prices from uh, from the same period the data set for both the sentiment analysis as well as the price data is split into a train test split of 80 to 20 uh, sliding window is calculated with the input sequence taken as 50 and output sequence taken as 1 the the process for sentiment analysis involved removing of unnecessary characters such as punctuations white spaces operators etc we then calculate the tf idf score and label the data uh, as zero corresponding to a decrease in prices compared to the previous day or one corresponding to the price on the particular day being the same as the previous day or increased corresponding to the previous day the random forest model is built with 200 estimators and entropy is being used to determine the information gain uh, and the hybrid architecture also has a price prediction model so it kind of tries to model the prices of the data this is done by creating a by lstm layer there are three by lstm layers with 128 64 and 32 nodes and a dropout of 0 0.2 uh, once the random forest model is built and the sentiment scores are calculated we'll need to sequentialize that as well so we create two other sub models 
each having a BioLSTM2, BioLSTM layers with the dropout of 0.2, and each of the model would model the positive polarity score as well as the negative polarity score as a sequence. So these three sequential models are concatenated together using a level one meta classifier. This forms the entire stacking ensemble. The meta classifier has seven layers uh, with ReLU activation function. The output uh, layer has only one node with ReLU activation function, and this node can either predict the output price or the predict the output rate of change of price. The hybrid architecture is trained for 1000 epochs with batch size of eight using RMS prop and MSC as the optimizer and loss function. Yes, sir. So we can see the uh, variation of loss per epoch for both uh, the BioLSTM price prediction model with no headlines or with 25 headlines. It can be seen that when headlines are included, the loss becomes closer to zero quite quickly as compared to without headlines. This shows that our model is able to uh, increase the amount of features which are present by using headlines. To calculate the number of headlines which are to be used, as our input data set has a total of 25 headlines, we evaluated the effect of number of headlines as well by using R pred predictive R squared as a metric. We can see that the, uh, the predictive R squared score is highest when we use 10 headlines. So we include only 10 headlines in our final model. Once the model is built, we try to predict the variation of the actual price compared to the predicted price. We can see that our uh, predicted prices are quite similar to the actual prices. It's, it is close and this shows that uh, by using headlines, we can actually predict the volatility in the data. We can see whether the data increases or decreases, and this is enough for an investor to make an educated choice. Uh, to find out how much the prices vary actually, we also take into account the prediction of rate of change of prices, and we calculate the graphs as well. Uh, to identify the effect of sentiment analysis, we map the probability range for each of the sentiment score, which is the negative sentiment and the positive sentiment, and calculate the average rate of change in US dollars for each of this uh, range. It can be seen that uh, for negative sentiment score, a very low negative sentiment score is enough uh, to cause a very wide deviation in prices, which is of almost a drop of $181. Whereas for a positive sentiment score, it can either be a very low score or a very high score. And once uh, news articles are either uh, being very positive about an increase in prices or a little less positive, then investors start to doubt whether the prices increase or not. And hence, this could result in a change in prices. To compare our uh, model with existing state-of-the-art architectures, we have uh, compared with other papers who have used the exact same data set. And we can see that our model performs best with an accuracy of 84.92%. Conclusion, we have built a multitask architecture which takes into account both the sentiment scores of new headlines as well as the prices in order to predict the output price as well as the rate of change of prices. We have also tried to map the effect of rate of change of prices with the sentiment scores and show that sentiment actually affects how prices vary. Uh, future works, we could take into account more data in order to build a more uh, a wider model uh, by using data sources such as Google Trend Analytics. This will show how much uh, actual trends in the market uh, is based on other factors. We could also build attention-based deep neural networks, which can use sentiment scores in order to optimize the model. We thank the chairs of CCE 2021 for giving us this opportunity to present our paper. Uh, we are welcome for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Interesting work. Now we have some minutes for a few questions from the audience. Does anybody has a question? Okay, you can write in the chat your, your, your question or raise your hand. Okay, I, I have a question. Uh, in, in your graph of, of the, the learning course uh, of the neural model, uh, did you use validation data? Uh, data for we haven't for avoiding used, overfitting. 
if you haven't used validation data, that was because the amount of data present is itself less. So we are not able to uh, we were not able to split it in such a way that we'll have a significant testing set which is unique. Uh, this is because it's a uh, it's a small data source since we had to calculate uh, uh, extract new set lines as well for a particular range, right? Uh, and hence we couldn't validate it. Okay, and how do you uh, guarantee that there is not overfitting in your model? Um, that no, we not overfitted, right? Okay, uh, so we have taken a separate uh, testing set which is uh, not inclusive of the training set. It is actually uh, the dates for the testing set would be after the training set. So when it comes into uh, price modeling, the prices of the testing set need not be similar to the training set, right? So even if the model is overfit, the testing set would be an accurate uh, representation of whether the model has learned well or not. Our, uh, our metrics which are calculated on the testing set aren't low. They are actually uh, quite uh, significant, right? So in case the model is overfit, then the testing set would also be affected, the testing uh, scores. Okay, and what was the number of estimators in the random forest? Uh, 200 estimators, we have taken oh, okay. okay, 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 thank you. Uh, okay, well, uh, I, I can see, I don't see here uh, any question. The chat, also I, I don't see raise hand. Okay, no, I, I think that there is not, not more questions from the audience. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Sasha, uh, for your thank presentation. You. Okay, thank you. And now uh, we we move on to the last presentation of this session. Uh, the, no, the name of the paper is Supervised Neural Network for Forgery Detection of Offline Handwritten Signature. Uh, the authors are Muhammad Aslam, Ana Maria Martinez Rodriguez, and Salim Sunra. Uh, I don't know if somebody of the authors is for presenting this paper. Mm, I don't see any of them in in the list of person that that I, that that are in the session. Mm, okay. Muhammad Aslam. Ana Maria Martinez Enriquez, Salem and Salim Zumra. Uh, okay, here is in, in the other um, um, list that there are person that there are no here. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I cannot see the authors here. The list of I, I'm calling to Sumran. Salem Sumra, but there are no here yet. Okay. Well, um, so uh, the, the authors are not for presenting this last paper. Okay. So I think that we can uh, finish the, the session. Thank well, you very the, much for. Okay. Uh, oh, the, sorry. The, sorry, the schedule says uh, 10 40. I, I think that we can. Waiting for forty minutes. Four minutes. Ah, okay, okay. You're right. You're right. Yeah. The schedule says we have some some minutes. Okay. It's ten thirty six here in Mexico. We can wait some a uh, couple of minutes. Uh, okay. The, the instruction for the author said that uh, at least ten minutes uh, before the presentation, but we can wait. Okay. For, for some author, yeah.
Okay, in the meanwhile, uh, I can invite uh, the audience to the plenary talk uh, I see here in the in the schedule that is at 11.30, time of Mexico City. Uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a plenary talk from Professor Jin Jun Shan, and he's going to talk about adaptive game theory decision making for autonomous driving vehicles. So we are, we hope your assistance to this interesting plenary talk in, 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 a, in one hour approximately. Okay, Samuel, um, it's 10 39, and I cannot see any of the authors here in the list. I cannot hear too. Okay, it's a shame. Well, um, okay, so I think that we can finish this session uh, because the, the, the last uh, paper is not the authors for presenting. Okay, thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you for all the presenters. Um, the words were, are very interesting. And I wish you uh, best wishes in your investigation. Thank you and see you in, in the next activities of this uh, Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel, for your assistance. Thank you, Dr. Wilfredo, and thank you to everyone. Okay.